Methane is not just a CO2 on steroids. It's true that it's powerful, but it's also true that it's short-lived. I meet so many ranchers and farmers who know way more about the land that they are working on than any of our silly dwellers ever will. In my opinion, it is extremely important that we as society support our farmers. I mean, I find myself in newspapers and uh, the journalists uh, writing about me criticize me not because of lack of scientific rigor, but they criticize me because I work with agriculture. How ridiculous is that? People always think that cattle and other livestock here in the United States are the greatest emitters worldwide, but that's really not true. This is Decentralized Radio. I'm Tristan. And I'm Ryan. The goal of this podcast is to help educate you on how to live your most optimal life. We will host industry expert guests to shed light on topics that matter. We are not gurus, rather two individuals who have had to pave their own path to health and vitality, independent of the centralized systems that plague modern society. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Decentralized Radio. Today, we have Frank Mitloner on the line. Frank, how's it going? It's going well. Thank you. Yeah. Um, as I was kind of mentioning pre-show, this is for me, this has been a long time coming. I, I found uh, Dr. Mitloner's work in 2020, 2021, when I was writing my book, Bitcoin and Beef, about kind of, yeah, the truth behind methane, uh, cattle, greenhouse gas emissions. So finally, we get to dive into this topic. I have, I've had, yeah, some burning questions for, for quite some time. And it's really exciting work that, that you're doing. But it's also definitely a very controversial space, uh, I would say. And I'm sure you've faced quite a bit of back backlash in, in the mainstream media. But that's why we love to have these conversations on, on decentralized radio. And I know Ryan and I have talked to mm -hmm. a lot of regenerative ranchers and are going to continue to do that. So this, this fits very well. And I know, yeah, Ryan's excited about the, the conversation also. No, I'm excited. I just want to give a slight forewarning. If ever you see me freeze... It's because my internet seems to be in and out. <laughs> Don't worry. For the listeners, they won't even notice a thing. But I just thought I'd mention that in case you see me stop every now. But no, it's going to be a fun discussion because I think there's a lot of misconceptions and just people just don't know. And like you were saying, uh, Frank, before we got on, you, you made a really, really uh, provocative comment, I thought, because you were saying people want to do the right thing, but they don't know what that is, per se. Or maybe they think they're doing the right thing and they're not getting the full story. So I'd love to dive into some of that, but I'll hand it back to Tristan because I know he's got some burning questions up front. Yeah, well, I guess let's kind of set the scene a little bit. So so maybe you could just at first describe what the greenhouse gas emissions from you know livestock, um, specifically cattle, just enteric emissions, maybe 101 here. You know, why, how are livestock, especially ruminant animals, producing methane? Yeah, first uh, a, an overview of greenhouse gases in a country like the United States. Um, about 80%, 8-0 of all greenhouse gases stem from the burning of fossil fuels. That's transportation, mm -hmm. power production, and so on. Uh, the EBA um, releases emission inventories every year, and that's their number. And the number for livestock they publish is 4% of total emissions. Uh, just to give you a general idea. So it's not nothing. You know, 4% is a sizable chunk. But it's also not what it's sometimes portrayed as, as the 800-pound gorilla. So we have to first be honest about what it is that we are talking about. Um, beef produces about 2 to 3% of the total greenhouse gases in the United States. And uh, dairy uh, would be number two on the livestock side. Um, and here there are three greenhouse gases. Three greenhouse gases we are dealing with in total. In, that's CO2, carbon dioxide. You and I are exhaling it right now vehicles emitted when we burn fossil fuels and so forth. So CO2, that's the most important one. The second one is methane. And the third one is nitrous oxide. Now, the most important one for animal agriculture is methane, because methane is the gas that's produced when ruminant livestock, such as cattle or goats or sheep, when they digest something nobody else can digest, which is cellulose. Cellulose is contained in grasses. It is the most important biomass on world, uh, in the world. And 
um, it is a carbohydrate that nobody else can digest, but cattle and goats and sheep are the ruminants. The reason why they can digest that is because they have microbes in their, in their stomach that can break the bonds between the, the carbohydrate molecules. So they can digest it. And that's great because that means they can use something nobody else can eat, they can digest it. And what's powering the whole thing is photosynthesis, um, so pretty much the sun. So that's the good news. The bad news is that the same process that makes this so great, namely that those microbes work with the cattle to digest the cellulose, these cell microbes produce methane gas. That's an unintended consequence, so to say. And that methane is belched out. It's coming out of the front end of those, those animals. So that's the one source of greenhouse gases from animal agriculture. And the second one is the animal manure. And our quest is now to reduce both enteric emissions, meaning front end emissions, as well as those from manure. So just sort of a brief aside to this to this initial question, just because I find it interesting, I think it sets a little context as well, because like you mentioned, a lot of people focus on carbon dioxide. And now there's a whole cycle that we could get into from like methane going into the atmosphere, this 12 year cycle, all this stuff, which I think would actually be a good overview. Maybe we can talk about that very briefly. But um, I think there's why, why are we focusing on methane? Why is methane? important to be focusing on mm -hmm. um just a quick side because it does trap more heat i believe um and that's i think why a lot of people are focusing on it but maybe sort of we could dive into why we're so hyper focused on, on methane and particularly uh which which parts of the animal industry are causing the most methane to be an issue or be focused mm -hmm. on so most climate scientists throughout the world, and I'm an animal scientist, an air quality specialist, not a climatologist, but most climatologists would tell you the number one gas we have to focus on is CO2 because every time we burn fossil fuels such as oil, coal, and gas, we're adding new and additional carbon to the atmosphere. That carbon was prior in the soil for millions of years. Um, and again, that's oil, coal, and gas. So every time we burn that stuff, we add this carbon that was in the ground new to the atmosphere. Methane is important because methane is almost 30 times more potent per molecule than CO2 in trapping heat from the sun. The best analogy I can give you is that of comparing a styrofoam cup versus a china cup versus a Starbucks $20 insulated cup. And uh, that analogy holds true for these three greenhouse gases. Uh, CO2 would be the styrofoam cup. You put coffee in it, but it cools down quickly. Uh, methane would be the china cup. It holds the, the heat from the coffee, so to say. That's our analogy here. Uh, warm much longer. And the nitrous oxide is a very potent greenhouse gas, and it is long-lived. So meaning um, it stays in the atmosphere for a very long time. And that would be the analogy of the Starbucks $20 insulated cup. So you have um, these three gases. The most abundant one is CO2, but the most powerful one in trapping heat from the sun is nitrous oxide with the number two being methane. And so methane, as I said, is mainly produced by ruminant animals through belching, that's front end emissions, they are burping it out. And uh, all the other livestock species also produce methane, but uh, in their case, it comes from animal manure. It comes from animal manure, okay? When that animal manure uh, decomposes, it releases methane as well. And I guess just in general, there, you know, staying on this topic, um, fundamentally, you're, you know, how are these gases different in lifespan? So you kind of, you know, alluded yeah. to that a little bit, and I know this is a, a big one for for CO two versus methane, um, yeah. because CO two can, to my knowledge, can be what five hundred thousand year lifetime, while methane's is is yeah. far shorter. Maybe you could explain that a bit. Yeah. So if you burn, if you drive your car, uh, and you burn gas, in other words, then that CO2 that comes through the tailpipe of your car will stay in the atmosphere for a thousand years. That carbon is not going anywhere. It stays there for a thousand years. Nitrous oxide is also another long-lived climate pollutant that once it's emitted, stays in the atmosphere for hundreds of years, at least a hundred years. So both CO2 and nitrous oxide are long-lived climate pollutants. Methane, while it's potent, as I said before, fortunately is not just produced, but there's a process that destroys methane. 
And that is a natural process. It's called uh, oxidation. To be precise, it's called hydroxyl oxidation. There are so-called radicals in the air, and these radicals destroy methane. And that, on average, takes a little bit over 10 years. Okay, so don't get me wrong. What I'm saying here it does not mean methane doesn't matter because it's short-lived. But it is short-lived, and because it's short-lived, its impact is happening during a short period of time, while the impact of the other greenhouse gases occurs for hundreds, if not thousands of years. So what this means is, Methane is not just produced by various sources, including cattle, goats, and sheep, but methane is also destroyed, naturally destroyed. If you hold a methane source constant, let's say in a given state you have a constant number of cattle, then an equal amount of methane that's produced by these cattle is also naturally destroyed. That means a constant source of cattle or a constant source of methane does not add additional warming to our planet. And that's important because any kind of burning of fossil fuel adds additional carbon to our planet and therefore additional warming. Now, that's not to say that methane doesn't matter. If we were to increase livestock herds, for example, then over time we would increase methane and that would add a lot of additional warming, which we don't want to. But, and this is the important part, if we manage to reduce methane, through any kind of mitigation from animal manure or from animal feeding or animal breeding or whatever we do, if we reduce methane, we reduce warming. That's widely appreciated. There's little dissent uh, uh, over that. If we reduce methane, we reduce warming. And, um, and this is what we are here to study and study aggressively. Yeah, to me, that was like the, the mind-blowing understanding that I had a couple of years ago is that the rate of change is, is really what matters for, for methane and the, the constant cattle herd are, yeah. Um, I guess just a quick question is when that gets broken down in, into the atmosphere, does it get broken down into CO2 or, or other gases? Is, is this something that, um, you know, could be also adding, you know, further Ella, you know, molecules to the atmosphere that could also be greenhouse gases, or is it kind of just being completely broken down into a natural water cycle or, or things like that? Yeah, that brings us to the discussion of the so-called biogenic carbon cycle. Mm -hmm. So first of all, what is methane? Methane is CH4. That's the chemical structure, CH4. The C in the CH4 is the carbon that we are concerned about. Where does that carbon come from? That's the initial question here. Where does the carbon that's in the methane come from? And the answer is it comes from CO2 originally. CO2 that was in the atmosphere is taken on by feed plants that our animals consume, whether it's grasses or legumes or others. And during photosynthesis, this atmospheric CO2 is incorporated into plants and converted into um, eventually... Uh, into volatile fatty acids, for example, that are then um, converted into meat or milk. But during the process of converting that carbohydrate from the feed plant, um, the microbes that do this, that make that happen, they produce methane. Just like you and I produce CO2 right now, we are exhaling it. These microbes that digest the cellulose and or the starch in the feed, they produce some methane. And that methane builds up in this very large rumen of those animals. A, a cow has a rumen with a volume of 50 gallons, so that's roughly the size of your bathtub at home. And that methane builds up in this in the stomach. And then once it does build up, it has to come out, and it comes out through the front end. And so that methane then stays in the air for approximately a decade, is then meeting after that time a radical and that radical destroys it and converts it back to where it came from, CO2. But this C and CO2 and water, I should say. So the CH4, the methane, becomes CO2 and water. But the CO2 that results from this breakdown of methane is not new and additional carbon added to the atmosphere because it was there before, before it went into the plants as... Uh, you know, during photosynthesis, that CO2 was already in the atmosphere. So when the methane breaks down into CO2, that resulting CO2 is not 
new and additional carbon added to the atmosphere. But this is a carbon cycle that goes around and around and around, and it takes a little over a decade. Hey, friend. Thanks for listening. If you really enjoy this podcast, it would be really appreciated if you left us a five-star review on Spotify, Apple, or subscribe to our content on YouTube. This helps us get to a larger reach and a larger audience to spread this wonderful free education. Yeah, that's something I just quickly is 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 an important I think distinction cuz cuz people just be like, "Oh, well methane gets broken down into CO2." But, you know, what's what's important to consider there is what you're saying is that this is not new into the system. This is not a new input. It's it's already been, I guess you could say in circulation in the, the carbon cycle as opposed to burning a fossil fuel that's been underground for a very long time or degrading soil health to the point that's releasing carbon that's been stored for hundreds, thousands of years. Um, so th that's exactly. good. Yeah. Exactly. So, so the fossil fuels, oil, coal, and gas are nothing other than plant and animal material that died, decayed, fossilized hundreds of millions of years ago. And it was in the ground for that long. Mm -hmm. Until 70 years ago, humans took out about half of all that fossil fuel. And what did we do with it? We burned it. And by burning it, we added this carbon that was underground into the atmosphere. And every time the sun hits those carbon molecules, they heat up. And that is not a short-lived cycle, but this is a one-way street of carbon from the ground into the atmosphere, always adding additional warming. No, that makes a lot of sense. And it's like you said, it's like accumulative and sort of looking at the big picture and looking at um, I mean, the timeline and, and you really look from like the industrial revolution on just like the amount of change that has happened since then is enormous. Um, and it, it's sort of like sort of in your face, which is kind of interesting to me because when you look at the just look at history. But I think one thing that sort of is on my mind is like when we look at the size of, say, because we're talking about methane and methane output from animal basically burps in some sense. Um, and, and manure, uh, when we look at the amount of, say, cattle in the U.S. and globally, how has that changed over the last several decades? And how has that created impact or lack thereof impact? So people always think that cattle and other livestock here in the United States are the greatest emitters worldwide, but that's really not true. Um, we have in the United States become extremely efficient in livestock production. On the beef side, we are producing 18%, one eight, 18% of the global beef here in the United States with 6% of the global beef herd. We used to have back in 1970, 140 million beef cattle, 140. Today we have 90 million, so 50 million fewer, but we are producing the same amount of beef. On the dairy side, we used to have 25 million dairy cows in this country. Today we have nine, so we went from 25 to nine, but with this much smaller herd today, we are producing 60% more milk. Six zero, 60% more milk with this much smaller herd. That means our carbon footprint has gone down by two thirds. Now, what I'm saying now shall not be viewed as Midlearner finger pointing at others, but it is important to uh, put that nuance into this discussion. The IPCC Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, when looking at livestock emissions globally, has ascertained that 80%, 80 of global livestock emissions occur in developing countries and 20% in developed countries. Now, why is that? That is because, particularly in those developing countries, um, people are lifted out of poverty, have more disposable income today than 10 years or 20 years ago. And the first thing they do when they are lifted out of poverty is change their nutrition, buy their family some eggs or some milk or some meat. And because there are so many people in these countries, the livestock herds grow because the efficiencies of livestock production haven't grown, haven't improved yet. And so in order to satisfy the nutritional needs of their people, they're growing livestock. Just to give you one idea of size, India and Brazil, these two countries together, have more cattle than the rest of the world combined. Okay, so that kind of makes you speechless, I assume. China, an emerging country, uh, produces and consumes half of the world's pork. One billion pigs are produced in China annually. 
And as a side note, of the 1 billion pigs they produce, they lose 40%, 40, 40% or 400 million pigs pre-weaning because of lack of nutrition, lack of health care, lack of you know, insufficient uh, genetics and so forth. So the issues, the greatest issues around livestock's environmental impact globally occur in developing countries. And uh, it is a misplaced quote, uh, criticism to say, well, you know, what we do in the United States is so bad because it's so intensive. Actually, the economy of scale that we see happening here in the United States is something that actually helps us to minimize our environmental footprint. Yeah, that's something I, I realized as well is, is it's astonishing that our, our cattle herd, our national cattle herd is is down like quite significantly. And, and you painted that picture uh, brilliantly and, and brought up all these good points. But yeah, if you go to Africa, India, Brazil, I mean, they're, yeah, the, the herd size is proliferating. Therefore, this is new. Uh, the rate of change is in contributing to increased methane then, right? Um, based on what we, uh, what everyone now understands um, from the beginning of this podcast. And my question is there, because you bring up these nuances, and, and this is kind of a fun discussion to have, is it's kind of the result of maybe industrialized economy of scale raising of livestock. But then conversely, you could argue that this is also degrading soil quality and the average feedlot beef on average has higher emissions compared to, say, a pasture raised regeneratively, um, I guess, raised animal. So how do you how do you think about this sort of complexity in terms of the style of raising? Because it seems like this industrialized system has led to, you know, a much smaller herd, much higher output, reduced emissions on, on that front. But now we're kind of at this point of where, you know, soil quality is degrading. Uh, you know, we're just growing GMO crops, which is also, you know, contributing to that to feed a lot of these uh, livestock animals. Um, although I know, you know, beef, for example, are still spending the majority of their life on, on pasture, but other animals. So how do you think about this, um, you know, difference in terms of raising practices? And, and obviously developed nations are, are on their own front, mm -hmm. but more specifically to, to here in the U.S. and, and first world countries. Yeah, so this is... Um... It's a very important discussion. It's also a very emotional discussion. And it's mm -hmm. a discussion where you have different camps, okay? Where you have a camp of people saying, you know, regenerative is the best, or holistic is the best, and others you say, you know, conventional is the best. And um, we are faced with realities. And these realities include that consumers, first of all, the vast majority of consumers value animal source foods. Um, in 97% of all refrigerators in the United States today, you find animal source foods, 97%. So first of all, that whole discussion of shall we or shall we not eat animal source foods, that's that's a ivory tower discussion, okay? Most people don't have that. They just eat animal source foods. The question now is how shall we raise animal source foods? So let's say in pig production, you can't just take the pigs that we have in this country and say, let's put them on pasture. It's not going to happen for many different reasons. One reason is biosecurity. Those animals are very prone to uh, catch diseases. Some of those are extremely infectious. Um, there's just no way that um, we would have an extensive pasture-based system for pigs or for poultry. Predation speaks against it. Biosecurity speaks against it. Um, not having enough oversight on animal health and so on speaks against it. Uh, it, it it wouldn't happen. And in most places in the world where they produce poultry and pigs, they're putting those animals indoors. And if you let these animals choose, by the way, if you allow poultry, let's say, broilers or laying hens, uh, to not just be indoors, but also you have a gate where they can choose to go out, then you'd be surprised how few of them do go out. They stay, yeah, they, they, they value safety over anything, anything, yep. right, yeah. So, but that's the monogastric animals, okay? And that's maybe a discussion that you're not, um, that you're not asking about as much as the one uh, of cattle, beef and dairy. Yeah. Ruminants, so, yeah. Right, so um, in the case of cattle in the United States, 
Um, on average, uh, the corn finished animal will go to slaughter anywhere between 14 to 16 months of age. So let's call it one and a half years. Um, it spends about two thirds of its life on pasture, first with its mama cow and then as a stalker on pasture, and then the last four to six months in a feedlot. So two thirds of its life will be on pasture, about a third of its life will be uh, in a feedlot. And the reason why it will end up in a feedlot is not so that uh, we can finish them faster and make more money or so, but uh, it has a lot to do with consumer uh, preferences. If you ask consumers in blind tests which meat they prefer, corn finished or grass finished beef, then the majority will point at the, at the corn finished beef. And that has to do with the quality of fat and the taste of fat, which is significantly different. I'm not talking about chemical composition of, you know, omega this and that fatty acid. I'm talking about um, the fat containing the specific taste that the American palate has gone, has gotten used to. And, um, and the marbling, if you look at your, at, at the palm of your hand and those veins that you see, uh, the equivalent of those veins in a, in a steak would be the marbling and that marbling contains the, the flavor. And so, um, the American palate has become very fond of that type of meat. And um, so now that was the corn finished animal. So they spent two thirds on pasture, one third in a feedlot. Um, and in the feedlot, they have fed a high concentrate diet of 80 to 90 percent, um, 80 to 90 percent um, uh, corn. So now going to the grass finished animals, these animals stay on pasture their entire lives and uh, they will live for 26 to 30 months of age. So roughly twice as long. Um, so that's a, a significantly longer lifespan, obviously. And that means they're eating more, they're drinking more, they're belching more. Uh, but most importantly, they're eating much more roughage because that's what their feed base is a very high percentage of roughage and roughage is the very uh, compound that the methanogens in the rumen, those microbes that produce methane, that is the one that they need to produce, to live. Okay. So the methanogens need roughage. They can't do anything with concentrates. So the more roughage you have in the diet, the more methane an animal will belch. And that, gentlemen, is the reason why when you go into a feedlot, you see very little rumination in those cattle. Because they're on an 80 to 90% concentrate diet, there's not enough roughage in the feedlot diet to produce methane. So the notion that grass-finished animals produce less greenhouse gases, let's say less methane, that notion is not true. Because they live much longer and they eat Roughage, which is much, uh, uh, sorry, grasses and other forages, which are much higher in roughage. And so even if you consider the fact that feedlot finished animals, of course, need to be fed corn or distillers grains, and that is shipped normally from far away and needs to be produced. If you do a life cycle assessment, then uh, the result will not point toward grass finished animals having a lower carbon footprint. Um, the feedlot finishing, whether we like it from an aesthetic perspective, looking at it, where animals are oftentimes cramped in relatively small spaces, uh, that's one thing that's separate. But if we just look at the carbon footprint, then the notion of lower uh, carbon footprints in grass finish systems is, is false. That does not mean that there are not other uh, ecological advantages. Um, of grass raising. For example, soil carbon sequestration mm -hmm. is an important one. And uh, soil carbon sequestration ranges widely uh, across soil, soil types and, um, and uh, precipitation. Um, so in some regions where you have a, a rich soil, soil carbon sequestration uh, does not occur at very high rates. If you have a poor soil, a soil then it does. And so that, that needs to be considered. Water impacts need to be considered. Biodiversity impacts need to be considered. It's a huge topic, as you can see. I hate to uh, be too specific, but uh, the discussion becomes super complex quickly. But it's not true to say just because they're on pasture, it's automatically better and lower in carbon emissions or so.
No, I think this is a really important discussion because it's easy, especially for me. You know, I'm, I'm very big on like regenerative raising of livestock and things like that. And, and if you don't really dive deep into this, you can realize um, you don't realize how much nuance there is on, on this topic. You can just look at, you know, white oak pastures, life cycle analysis, and, you know, it's negative carbon uh, beef they're producing. But yeah, like you said, this is just one example. And then it's a, a trade off of, you know, they're, they're living twice as long. And, and we've had other folks on to talk about like the nutritional differences. And yep. um, Dr. Stefan von Fleet, he's very uh, open minded and pragmatic about these things, too. It's like maybe there's a happy medium mm -hmm. where we have this regenerative raising of that, you know, say that two thirds of the beginning of every cow's life, every beef cow's life. And then maybe they're still fed grain. Um, at the end or in a feedlot or, you know, there's a happy medium somewhere. So I, I think it is important context and I don't want to be um, ignorant by just, you know, blasting out regenerative agriculture, but that also brings, you know, extremely important principles in terms of soil restoration and carbon sequestration. Um, and then, you know, how we grow the crops, right? Like, do we need to have monocrop GMO grains in the feedlots? Not, no, we don't, but we could have, you know, multi-species cover crops being grown. We could have a more regenerative system from the plant perspective to then feed the cattle, which will still help that overall mm -hmm. life cycle um, greenhouse gas emissions, I think. So, yeah, how, how do you find these conversations going? Because it must be very challenging to have them with everyone in their specific camps. And I don't yeah. think they probably get along very well. So I'm curious, you know, how is the progress in this front from your side, from your perspective? Um, because regenerative is very, you know, it's a buzzword. It's actually being greenwashed at this point. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of people know about it, but what's actually going on on the ground? So you're absolutely right. There is a, a lot of greenwashing across all sectors of society. I mean, every company out there is now saying we want to be carbon neutral, climate neutral, net zero this, net zero that. And most of them don't really know what they're talking about. I have to tell you that quite clearly. Um, one of the things that's very important to me is that people in animal agriculture, first of all, inform themselves of what the true contributions of their operations are, what they have been, where they are now, where they can be in 10, 20 years. Uh, I think this denialism is a problem. Uh, many people in agriculture still don't believe in a changing climate, which I find uh, bizarre, considering what we're observing year after year. Um, so I do assist them in uh, finding out what their current impacts are and what kind of approaches they can take to lower those impacts. Because we do have that obligation as a societal member, regardless of which sectors we are a part of, to do better. And, um, and I find it really encouraging that I see now many ranchers, many farmers in general, looking more into this. What can I do with respect to low-till or no-till, with respect to uh, deworming my herds or not deworming my herds because uh, I want to take care of my dung beetles? Because if I have um, manure that's uh, dropped off my animals and, uh, and there are dung beetles that can incorporate them into the soil within a few hours, don't I want that? I'm just back from Colombia where they were really big on dung beetles. And I'd never really thought about dung beetles that much. But I saw a bunch of farmers showing me um, how these dung beetles took entire paddies, manure paddies, and within 10, 15 minutes, the entire paddy was gone. It was in the soil in no time. And uh, a day later, it was 30, 40 centimeters incorporated into the soil. And uh, they told me, uh, look, you know, we really view these things as our allies. Uh, if we use this and that and the other dewormer, then these dewormers kill our dung beetles. We don't want to do that. So they are now paying attention to this kind of thing. I meet so many ranchers and farmers who know way more about the land that they are working on than any of our silly dwellers ever will. They understand the soil, they understand the climate, they understand the animal plant interaction. They understand what it takes to grow the food we all need. So, in my opinion, it is extremely important that we as society support our farmers. Okay, this is not a fringe group. This is a critically, a 
strategically important um, job sector in our economy, as important or more so than the health sector. The food sector and the health sector are the two most important ones. Our farmers deserve better. Now, you ask me what kind of discussions I, um, I experience. I, I incur discussions that are, um, many of them are very um, empowering to me, showing me that the work we do is important and, and how what we do really has an impact in the real world outside our university bubble. Uh, how we are advancing the sustainability of animal agriculture and our food system overall. But then I also have really disheartening interactions of people who hate animal agriculture. They hate everything around it. And uh, that starts with the farmers who deal with livestock and it ends with the scientists who deal with farmers that are livestock related. And that's people like myself. I mean, I find myself in newspapers and uh, the journalists uh, writing about me, criticize me, not because of lack of scientific rigor or any of that or any kind of uh, improper behavior, but they criticize me because I work with agriculture. How ridiculous is that? I'm an agricultural scientist. That is in my job description. So, <laughs> but it really does happen. And, um, and, you know, I mean, I'm senior enough to laugh at, laugh about it at this point, but, um, I tell you, there are uh, many attempts to intimidate people like myself and uh, not have them partake in public discussions on these topics. I love everything you just said because it, it really puts a framework around the idea that I think people need to take away when they talk about topics like this is that they are nuanced, they are complex, and that it's very easy for the common person or, as you say, city dweller. I really like that. I'm going to start using city dweller. I don't know why I haven't. <laughs> I am one kind of, but it's very easy. And I can look into my past and see friends of mine who look at the world this way and read various headlines from publications that they enjoy or subscribe to and take away that as a verbatim what's happening when you are speaking to people on the ground or we are speaking to people that are on the ground on the front lines, like working on farms who own ranches, mm -hmm. who know the land. It's really those people that we should be looking to for answers because th they'll know insurmountably more than any of us could ever dream of had we you know been doing the work that they're doing in the front lines i think it's very valuable and i think it's under sort of undermined in the in the space and it's really good to have those discussions i'm glad yeah, you're right. having some that are pretty pretty good that makes yes. me feel positive yes now uh, you know i teach i teach we have about 1600 undergraduate students in animal science here at uc davis we're the largest animal science major in the country and um, last lecture on Tuesday, I um, read them a statistics that got that got everybody uh, really, but really very very edgy. Um, and that was a statistics that came out of the last USDA census for the United States agricultural census. That is, and the statistics goes as follows: We have two million farmers in total in the United States. Two million. Considering the total population being 330, 330 million, 2 million sounds like a reasonable number. But of the 2 million farmers we have in this country, 1.5 million have an annual revenue of less than $25,000. So one and a half of the 2 million farmers cannot feed their family through farming. And 80,000 farmers in the United States produce two thirds of all the food we all consume. I repeat that 80,000 farmers in this country produce two thirds of all the food we all consume. And their average age is close to 60 years, meaning they are close to retirement age. So now I go back to the question you asked me before, which is what kind of agriculture should we have? Should we focus on regenerative and grazing, or should we focus on the other one, the more conventional, the more intensive? Well, I guess my answer is we need them all. And we need to work with all of them to improve whatever status they are in currently and make it the most sustainable we know of, because we will need all of them. We don't want those 60-year-old farmers to say, you know what, I have enough of all these people telling me how to do my business and I will not encourage my son or daughter to take over. I'm out of here. And then I ask you, Ryan, I ask you, Tristan, who will feed us in the years to come 
when these six, when these uh, eighty thousand folks say we are out of here, who will feed us? Yeah, it's it's really a crisis to be honest, and and we've talked about the age of the farmers uh, on this show quite a bit, the ranchers, and to me, it's. Yeah, it's more important than ever. And you just see these things in the mainstream media, just yeah, bashing people, food producers really across the board. And it's, I I can't understand it. And then you go and talk to these folks that you're, you know, you're mentioning this 75% that are not making a livable income, but they're still putting in the work every day. And it's, yeah, it's heartbreaking. And to me, it's, it, it is the sign of a, a broken system completely. And that's why, you know, I think it's a big problem that we've seen this further consolidation because they just can't afford to, you know, do this any longer. Um, and I think it's the right perspective because it's not realistic to just snap your fingers and everyone to be regenerative farmers and, you know, the flowers are blooming and everyone's happy. Yeah, that's nice. I, I would love for that to happen, but it doesn't work like that, right? So mm. I think it's this transition period that we're going to have to have. It's going to take decades, um, but it's really important to just support your farmers first off. So that's why we preach constantly buy, buy local, like go meet a farmer, go meet a rancher, understand their play, their journey, what they're going through and, and how you can support them. That's why I do like that because you're putting a connection in place. And then if there's a connection, there's more likely to be support there consistently. Um, and yeah, but again, could the U S survive without the, the big four meat packers and just the big, uh, food producers right now? No, we couldn't. So there is a place for them. But again, I think, yeah, we just need to not be ignorant of where our food comes from and just strive for improvement just consistently. Right. So speaking of that, I guess maybe we could get into a little bit of, of what you're working on in terms of improvement from a sustainability perspective. And one of those things, uh, the main thing uh, from what I've seen is is the methane capture from manure lagoons uh, from from dairies? Maybe maybe you could talk about that a little bit because it's pretty innovative and it's pretty cool. So we are working on all forms of methane reduction and all forms of greenhouse gas reduction, and that includes enteric emissions, meaning the belching. It also includes the manure management, and last but not least, we also work uh, to some extent in in soil related issues, uh, soil carbon sequestration, but. Since you ask about the manure first, uh, the state of California has decided to reduce methane by 40%, for zero. And that 40% reduction, which is the most aggressive in the world, shall occur until the year 2030. So in seven years from now, our farmers have to reduce 40% of methane. And the law says that those methane reductions shall occur from manure sources. And it specifically says, uh, thou, you, you shall not, um, um, you're not mandated to reduce enteric emissions. Okay. So, um, so what did our dairies do? They looked at where uh, our methane, um, where's our methane coming from? And they quickly found it was the lagoons, the liquid storage of manure in lagoons. Uh, a lagoon is 98% water and 2% solids. And, and in that in that lagoon, you have perfect anaerobic conditions, meaning oxygen-deprived conditions, much like they are in a rumen of a cow. Um, and these, these lagoons are the main source of methane related to manure storage. So um, the state incentivized our dairy farmers to cap those lagoons, put a cover on top, in other words, and very quickly, you see a bulging of the plastic of the cover. And that bulging is the capturing of biogas. Biogas is a, uh, is a combination of various different gases. The number one is methane. 60% of the biogas is methane. And methane is really, if you want to see it that way, pure energy, okay? Like what you... What you cook your food with or heat your home with, that's pretty much methane. It's natural gas. And, um, and so the farmers are now preventing this biogas from getting into the air by capturing, by capping and capturing the biogas. And then that biogas is converted into a fuel type 
called renewable natural gas, RNG. And that fuel type is then going into heavy-duty trucks and buses. And it replaces diesel, which they used previously. So you're now reducing greenhouse gas emissions on the farm via digester, this, these covered lagoons, and you are replacing the use of diesel on our roads. And that's a double whammy. And as a result, our farmers get paid large credits for that. And that's what makes it financially attractive. And this voluntary incentive-based approach works. It's what I call the carrot approach. You tell farmers, we want you to reduce your emissions, but there will be a market that will pay you for that. Much like there's an incentive for you to buy an electric car, because if you do so, then you get tax credit of sorts. And that's an incentive for you to change from an internal combustion engine to an electric car. The farmers have that incentive by being paid for converting biogas into transportation fuels. And so this carrot approach that we have here in California has led almost a little over 200 farmers, large farmers, over 2,000 cows per dairy, to cap their lagoons, to cover the lagoon, to cap it, to cap the gas, and then convert it into transportation fuels. This one technology alone in California has reduced 2.5 million metric tons. 2.5. And the goal by 2030 is 7.2. So our farmers have already reduced 2.5. The goal is 7.2. In addition to more dairies doing what I just said, we will also have feed additives fed to cows. Imagine a little bit of a of a mm, a little bit of a feed additive added to the diet of animals that then changes the rumen microbiology. It either disfavors those microbes that produce methane or it inhibits the methane enzymatic activity. So there are these two different pathways. Uh, there are now some additives that are capable of reducing 10% enteric methane, others up to 50% methane. Uh, the challenge is most of them are not FDA approved Food and Drug Administration approved yet, but they will be. And in the next few years, we will have a larger number of tools available to our farmers to achieve those methane reductions. It's going to happen. Our farmers will reduce 40% methane. And by doing so, by reducing methane so aggressively, they will reduce warming. Not just will they offset their own current warming, or become climate Sorry, neutral, but sure. they will also offset some of their historical warming. So our dairy industry will be climate neutral before the year 2030, and they will even help other industries to reduce uh, climate impacts through carbon trading. So what the dairy industry here has done is something that other industries need to do as well, the beef industry uh, here in the state, but also um, livestock industries all over the country and all over the world. We can do it. We can reduce methane. We can reduce greenhouse gases by knowing what the sources are, by knowing what the techniques, technologies are to, to tackle them, and by taking this topic seriously. If we manage methane, we become part of a climate solution. I mean that's it's so fascinating because I was I've been I've been reading about that a little bit and the fact that you've they've already been successful at reaching basically thirty percent of the goal mm -hmm. is in, is incredible based on like that that one addition. I know you guys are also working. I know I read something that was talking about you guys uh, identified like a genetic variant for uh, methane production. And you're working on targeting selective breeding and then also like some other modalities that are pretty interesting as well. But I think the whole thing is awesome. The fact that you're reusing the methane in other ways is just I mean, it's just a no, it's, it's a no brainer, but it's brilliant at the same time, which is really, really cool to see. I guess one, one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm sort of curious that it's impossible to know for sure, but what is the greater impact of like, if, if we got this implemented, let's say, um, as we're doing across the dairy industry, across California, but nationwide, what's that you were saying? Like, do we know like how much reduction on a larger scale that, that could be? Because I know earlier we were talking about how a lot of the issue with cattle emissions specifically are really from um, developing nations. And so while we're already better off than them and we'll become even 
better with some of these practices, what does that look like on the global scale? Are you interested in 100% grass-fed, grass-finished bison meat? I'm excited to be a partner with Falls Family Ranches. Based in Wyoming, Falls Family Ranches is raising high-quality bison meat the way nature intended. As a native large ruminant of North America, bison is one of the most nutrient-dense foods you can consume. If you're interested in trying out their bison boxes, use code TRISTAN, T-R-I-S-T-A-N, 10, for 10% off your first order. Yeah, so great question. So first of all, as I said uh, initially, in the United States, all of livestock combined emits about 4% of total greenhouse gas emissions. So if we do the best job possible, the absolute best job you can think of, then we might get that number down to 2%. Okay, it is unavoidable that the livestock sector will release some some greenhouse gases. Okay, this is the nature of the beast, no pun intended. In developing countries, um, the situation is different. There, they will not lean on technologies like feed additives or anaerobic digesters, but they will first and foremost have to look at efficiencies. For example, in many developing countries we see animals that we call idle animals. Idle animals, what does that mean? So imagine the following, imagine you turn your car on while it's sitting on your driveway, but you're not driving it. You're turning it on, but you're not driving it. The analogy of that is actually happening in the livestock sector in parts of the developing world. For example, in many African countries, Livestock is not raised to be slaughtered at the, at the quickest, at the fastest way, um, but livestock plays many different roles. They are not just uh, raised to be eaten, but they are also uh, the payment system and the social security system and the, you name it, they have many different, um, many different functions. And as a result, many beef animals in Africa live 15, 20 years. Okay, that's a huge huge lifetime in which those animals eat and excrete and consume water and so on, but are not eaten. A country where it's worse than in Africa is India. Because while we have 9 million dairy animals here in the United States, India has 300 million. So we have nine here, they have 300 million. But after you, you know that they don't eat uh, cattle meat, right, in India. And so that means when an animal falls out of production after it's done lactating, then nobody will eat that animal. So what happens to that animal? It's kept alive. They just open the farm gates and let this animal go. If you visit India, no matter where you go in India, you will see cattle walking around everywhere. These animals are no longer owned by anyone. They're just walking around because they cannot be eaten and they no longer have a productive life. So they are now idle animals, as idle as your car running in your driveway. And this is not a small side issue. This is a massive issue at global scale. We're talking about hundreds of millions of large ruminants that have no real use, that are just roaming around aimlessly because of cultural issues. Now, I'm not messing with religion here, okay? I'm not saying that uh, people should change their religion, but I'm just saying that is a massive environmental footprint, um, and it's just it's just happening. And I told you before, uh, in China, where they produce half of the world's pigs, they have a pre-weaning mortality of 40 percent. 400 million pigs in China are produced but never eaten because they die pre-weaning. They go to landfills, and that is a number that's greater than the entire U.S. pork crop. So we're not talking about small pocket change here. We're talking about significant numbers. So there is a lot of work to be done, particularly in developing countries. And I have a really good insight because I actually studied tropical, subtropical agriculture, and I'm specialized in that. I'm just back from Colombia, a country I loved. I thought it was really fascinating to visit. But I was shocked to hear that the average milk production per dairy cow in Colombia is five liters per day. In the United States, it's 45 liters. There, it's five liters. This is absolutely minuscule. In many places in India, it's two liters a day. Now, if you have such low production, you need massive herds to satisfy the nutritional needs of its people. 
And that really can be changed. So in developing countries, technologies such as feed additives or digesters are not the way to go, at least not now. But improvements in efficiencies are a better veterinary system, better reproductive services, better feeding of animals, better genetic material for feed crops and for the animals themselves are absolutely needed to shrink what in many places are very large herds into much smaller herds, much like we have done here. Yeah, that's that's astounding. I mean, there's if you're like an entrepreneur, you probably just be like losing your mind over how much opportunity there could be in you know a place like India to capture all this free roaming beef. That's just, uh, or I guess, just dairy cow, which is good meat too. I mean, um, yeah, that's that's incredible. I think it's it's almost unavoidable that nations, economies just almost have to go through these cycles, but you'd hope that they can look towards the Western nations, the more industrialized nations and see what we've done and kind of fast track that to getting to a more efficient standpoint with maybe less of the, you know, roller coaster that, that happened, but sometimes it doesn't work like that. And again, it comes back down to, I think it's important to focus on what we're doing as a nation and, and, and leading the charge, but then also not being ignorant of the entire global scale. So something that kind of ties back then to these global climate change, the IPCC just agendas and, and initiatives. To me, it's it's really shocking because I'm I'm, a, I'm very aware of, of all this and yeah, developing nations, even for you know um, energy consumption, right? Like they're burning much less efficient sources of, of energy because that's just the system or the progression that nations go through, right? Um, they mm -hmm. don't just go to burning like super clean natural gas or, or renewables like right off the bat. And it's, a, it's an issue for me because it seems like more and more restrictions are being implemented or they're wanting to be implemented in terms of livestock production, say in Ireland, New Zealand. I don't know what's going on in the US, mm -hmm. but it comes back down to how it's categorized and how it's kind of segmented. So how, what, are, what are your thoughts on this um, kind of happy medium approach? Because we are in a much better place in the developed nations, but there still seems like this action that's trying to be implemented, you know, getting more plant-based, going away, having more restrictions. And then this is all tied back to the GWP 100 way of measuring this. So you're, you're mentioning all these numbers, 4%, getting it down to 2%. Is this even the right metric? Um, so I'm, I'm curious on your thoughts here because there's so many different opinions. There's so many different forces at play here. And I think what you're doing is absolutely fantastic work, but we're still kind of like doing this dance of climate change restrictions and then mm – -hmm. um, just metrics that maybe aren't aren't the best so you just threw a lot of questions yeah, at me. yeah. <laughs> let I, me just grip let me just yeah grip one I, was, I was just curious if tie tie a bow on exactly yeah how how we are um interacting with the current uh legislation around climate change in in the modern world so 30 years ago in 1990 there was the kyoto climate accord um that was negotiated, a global climate accord um, that really required that politicians understood how greenhouse gases differ from one another. And scientists uh, developed this matrix called GWP 100, Global Warming Potential 100, which said that one molecule of methane is 28 times more powerful than one molecule of CO2. And it said that one molecule of nitrous oxide is 265 times more powerful than CO2 than one molecule of CO2. And so these factors of 28 and 265 were easy to understand for everybody. If a farm emits 10 tons of methane, all you have to do is multiply that by the factor of 28, 10 times 28, 280 tons of CO2 equivalent emissions. So I hope I didn't lose any of your, lose, uh, of your uh, listeners, but this is how it was done. And it was done because it was nice and simple. The scientists developing those uh, those numbers had 
dozens of footnotes underneath those tables where they were presented in, and those footnotes were then just cut off because there was too much information for those policymakers to be used. And they shouldn't have been cut off because methane has nuance to it that is not captured with this just one number of 28. Methane is not simply a CO2 on steroids. Remember that. Methane is not just a CO2 on steroids. It's true that it's powerful, but it's also true that it's short-lived. And that has a real impact on its behavior on warming our planet. And what I just said is what really matters. Why do we care about greenhouse gases? Ask yourself that. Why do we care about methane? Why do we care about CO2 and nitrous oxide? We care about them because they cause warming. And if we want to characterize how much warming is caused by an industry, let's say the cattle industry, then we need to have a unit that describes the warming. GWP100 is not that matrix generating that unit that characterizes warming. GWP100 simply tells you how much CO2 equivalent emissions an industry emits. And that it does not describe how much warming you get from it. The new matrix developed from Oxford University that does describe how much warming comes from a given industry, called GWP star, does account for the potency of this gas and it does account for the short long uh, for the short lifetime of this gas. And so, if you assume that you have a constant source of methane which we by and large have, let's say, with our beef or dairy herd. And if you look at a 20-year uh, period of time, if that livestock herd is constant, and if you use this old matrix GWP100, then you are overblowing its impact by a factor of three to four. I've been saying this for years. Oxford has saying this for years. The media thought we are trying to deflect the responsibility of animal agriculture on climate. But in the latest Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change IPCC report called AR6, what I just said was exactly quoted, namely that GWP100, the unit that has been used for so long, if used on constant sources of methane, overblows its impact by a factor of three to four. And if you don't believe me, I don't mean you, but any of your listeners, it's in the AR6 report on page 123. So they've, this new, they've admitted, or the IPCC has recognized this, basically, yes. is that what you're saying? Oh, they wow. have recognized this, that That's this fantastic. GWP matrix, GWP100 matrix, is flawed in so far that it does not describe a constant or a, um, a source that is, is going downward uh, accurately, yes. That's fantastic. I wasn't aware. Um, yeah, I remember reading about was Dr. Probably Miles Tristan Allen. Browns. I thought it was me for a second. Dr. M Miles Allen's work at oh. Oxford is is incredible. Um, so three to four x is is a big difference there. Um, I think that's that's important in terms of the warming impact. So I, I just I just wanted to highlight that, but I wasn't aware that I guess the IPCC and these governing bodies are are starting to come around. This is very encouraging to hear that. Yeah, I have a couple of years ago presented this and my criticism to GWP100 uh, to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO, in Rome, and uh, here to a steering committee um, that deals with livestock. And uh, the steering committee member said, if what Midwinner is true, then we are really mischaracterizing the impact livestock has on climate. So we need to find out whether that's true. And so the FAO established a global task force with well over 50 members, a third of those were IPCC members, but all of them were experts in the field uh, of either livestock or climate or air quality. I was one of those experts, by the way. And the final report was released last month and released uh, in Rome at the FAO headquarters, uh, now to be read by anybody who's interested. It's on biogenic methane. If you just Google bio biogenic methane and FAO, then you get to that report. And it describes what I just described to you, namely that there is an old, outdated uh, matrix, GWP100. There's a new one, GWP star, that does account for the real way that methane characterizes or influences warming. 
Uh, and it deals also with all kinds of mitigation issues and uh, quantification issues and so forth. So we are now way ahead of where we were five years ago with respect to our understanding of how livestock affects climate, um, how we can address it, how we can mitigate it, and how we can turn something that's broadly seen as a liability or a problem into an asset. Because nobody would say that the natural gas that you have at home to warm your house or to cook your meals, that that gas is a problem, right? It can be a problem if you just open the valve and you don't burn it, then it's a problem. But normally it's not a problem, it's a utility. You're using it because it's energy. And what is produced by our livestock is the same thing. We just have to find ways of using it, for example, through covering lagoons, through anaerobic digesters, or to avoid it by uh, feeding feed additives so that this gas is not produced. So we need to manage it, in other, in other words. No, that's actually really uh, promising what you were saying, because I, I felt for a very long time that there's been like this mischaracterization of how we achieve the goals. And there's been like this, in my mind, sort of a misplaced hyper focus on uh, the the way we've raised animals and stuff as being like this huge predominant force, which don't get me wrong, like you were saying, it is important to address and it's great that we are addressing it because it does, you know, solve issues and it does have an effect. But it's sort of like it's putting the cart before the horse of I think like maybe the majority of issues and not even we weren't even talking about like the way our agricultural infrastructure is and like transporting all these things around the nation, around the world um, as well. So I, I, that's that's actually super promising. One thing I was going to ask you is like, so how, how does this view then impact the way we view like trying to reach net zero emissions as a nation by 2050? Like, how does that change uh, calculation if sort of we've maybe misrepresented the numbers, if that makes sense in some way, shape or form? So... This issue of GWP 100 versus GWP star is mainly one that's important to those industries that have methane as their main greenhouse gas. And there are very few of these industries. Uh, it's the livestock industry, it's the rice industry, um, and to some extent, uh, the fossil fuel industry, because when you extract fossil fuels via fracking, let's say there's also some methane coming out of there. And then it's landfills, okay? But the rest of society, um, does not have methane as a major issue, but CO2. So whether we use the one matrix or the other is not uh, a maker or breaker overall. But for animal agriculture, it's really important to characterize the warming impact of methane correctly. That's very important because whether or not you are uh, emitting 100 or 300, 400, and that's the factor three to four, that makes a big difference, right? It makes a big difference. What we want is, so first of all, the GWP 100 will not go away. People have used it for 30 years. It will not go away. But we should use the new, more accurate GWP star in parallel to really inform our farmers and also society what the real impact of that sector is on climate. And that should be uh, the base for policy making. It should be the base for uh, action by farmers. Now, why? Because what this really means accounting for atmospheric removal of methane is that if we reduce methane over time through mitigation of various types, if we reduce methane, then we are replenishing fewer methane than is naturally destroyed. And that means we have really a net reduction of methane. And that net reduction of methane over time leads to a net reduction of warming. And that means this sector of animal agriculture can be one of the very few, the other sectors can't do that, it's only agriculture and forestry that can do it, can lead to reduced warming and therefore become part of a climate solution. This is not some kind of creative accounting or greenwashing as some of the critics of animal agriculture ascertain, but it is real. This is math, okay? This is math, physics, and chemistry and not politics. 
Yeah, and it, it's fascinating because we do have this ability to capture methane as, as an energy source, as you were saying. And we've had uh, actually some Bitcoin miners on the podcast as well talking about natural gas flaring. And actually, I think there's a company uh, trying to do something with landfills as well. And, and it's just a small dent into what they can really you know, make. But it's, it's showing the innovation is there. And we do have this usable energy. And if we just incentivize it, whether that be through you know, the, the carrot approach like you're saying or hooking up uh, you know, something that can convert that into actual money, then we're solving a problem. But the incentives need to be there or else nobody's going to do it. Nobody's going to be motivated um, to do it. So it, it's, it's awesome to see this kind of innovation. And that's why I think your work is, is important. And, and that's why we like to educate folks on, folks on this topic as well. But I guess the last question here, um, because you, you're, you're in the you know, UC Clear Center and you guys are doing a lot of great work and it's not all just about emissions and, and carbon and something that gets maybe convoluted a little bit, uh, in my opinion, is the hyper focus on carbon as compared to other pollutants, mm -hmm. other environmental toxins. What is your perspective here just in general on that exactly, that, that hyper focus from legislation and, and governing bodies on carbon versus other pollutants and environmental toxins that are also detrimental. And is, is this something that you also study and um, are, are doing at the CLEAR Center? Yeah, absolutely. I've been here at UC Davis as a professor for the last 21 years. When I came to the state of California, the newspapers were full with articles saying that cows rival cars as smog producers. And at the time, wow. I found out that these uh, assertions were based on 1938 data that had nothing to do with smog forming gases. Okay, so but as a result of that, as an air quality specialist, I then had to study all the potentially smog forming gases coming from livestock. And uh, I found many things that were not really intuitive, but um, but really changed the whole narrative around this impact of livestock on smog. Formation. And by the way, in California, in the, in the Central Valley, where we have most of our cattle, we have the worst air quality in the United States. So this kind of um, this kind of headline really means a lot to a farmer. Okay, when you have all of a sudden the worst air pollutant source in the country, in this in the in the country, uh, then you want to know is that true or not true? And so what we found was, first of all, these 1938 data were totally in. Uh, they were totally flawed, I mean, completely flawed. But what we also found was that the assertion that this, uh, that these gases come from manure was wrong. Uh, they don't come from the manure, they come from animal feed before animals eat it, namely particularly fermented feeds, which are silages. And uh, we found ways of minimizing those gases and so forth. Then we studied um, a lot of nitrogen issues uh, carbon issues, not just uh, methane, but also other volatile organic compounds. We studied uh, criteria pollutants like ammonia. We studied nuisances such as odors, dust, fly issues. So all these issues are air quality and climate issues, um, but we are not limited to that. We also have uh, graduate students, PhD students focusing in on animal welfare issues. Um, or on worker issues. Believe it or not, the most important sustainability issue today in California's agriculture is not the environment, it's not animal welfare, it's not food safety, it's workers. Attracting and retaining a qualified workforce is the number one sustainability issue besides financial viability. Okay, Attracting and retaining qualified workers. Because most Americans don't want to work in agriculture anymore. They don't want to they don't want to pluck strawberries or plant uh, asparagus or something, okay? So we have a, an army of people from other countries. Most of them are illegal immigrants, and they are doing that for us. But uh, if we think that this will always happen, think again. It will not always happen. We already have shortages all over the place. So long story short, we are not limit, limiting ourselves to carbon emissions, to greenhouse gases and warming. But we are working on all kinds of other sustainability issues, too. Uh, I think uh, that the current focus on carbon, on methane, is not doing us um, any good. I think, yes, we should study that and we should place 
a considerable focus on it, but uh, for example, not looking at reactive nitrogen is a big mistake because nitrogen is at least as big a topic, if not a larger topic than carbon. Yeah, and I asked that because I yeah, wanted to give appreciation to your other work. I think you're probably maybe a little tired of talking about methane and greenhouse gas emissions from cattle, but it's 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 important because that is the main narrative. But to me, there's there's so much more out there that we could be discussing and, and we could be improving upon. So um, thanks thanks for sharing that, and yeah, maybe we'll have to have a future discussion. But uh, I appreciate you so much for, for coming on and, and enlightening our guests. I think this is a really important topic and something that, yeah, is convoluted by so many different media outlets and a lot of perspectives in the game. So thank you. And if people do want to find out more about your work, your research, what's the best place to find them? I'll just go to clear.ucdavis.edu. And you'll land on our webpage and you'll find uh, anything your, your heart desires from um, links to our Twitter, uh, YouTube videos, um, blogs, explainers, and so on. Awesome. Well, Frank, thanks so much for coming on. We appreciate it. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in to another episode of Decentralized Radio. We'll see you next time. <laughs>